Smokey hear me? Yeah, I, I, I see that you're moving, you do, yes. Okay, good to see you all. Uh, any questions, comments from the material presented last week? Apparently, didn't get your mic turned. Aha, I was wondering about that. Yeah, you said so. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. I did say something about oh, it. Oh, it's, it's unmuted now. Okay. Yet? No? Yeah, the one thing that's kind of hard to find is the PowerPoints because I went in to try and find them and it doesn't show it as the as a PowerPoint as file. Week. Yeah, and when I just looked when you were running through them, they're below last week's yeah. PowerPoints. So you have to go into last week's PowerPoint. No, they should be this in this in the this week. Oh, they're, they're not. This week isn't loaded yet. Oh, okay. That's why, because I yeah. was like, we were just talking about so that, so like, oh, they're in it, there. it is possible for me to upload the week before it happens. Would you like that to happen? Yeah, that would be awesome. But I often compose, like, as, as things happen, because things are always changing. But I can upload the, you know, like this week's now. Well, not now, but. You, so gotcha. you. The class is expressing a preference for the PowerPoints up front. Yeah, yes? Because it's hard to... Yeah. Because we have lines that we can go with right. each slide. Right. And so you like uh, like handout in three. Okay. Fine. All right. General, that's a general consensus? When you find the PowerPoint. They're on Moodle. On the Moodle site. And then what you do right there... The well, your, your machine, so I save them, save them as PowerPoint files and as PDFs. So a PDF can be read by any computer that has Adobe, generally. And PowerPoints can only be read by a machine that has the Microsoft Office suite. Okay. Hey, Andre. Andre. I'll get Chris to load my sponsors. Cool. And, what you just, and then what you just type, what you feel is the PowerPoint? No. You, the, you, what you get is what you see on television. Just for notes, or to just for notes. Later. Yeah. Okay. So you can print them like this. You can print them off. Yeah, like like off. she did. You can print them off, okay. and they're like. And then when he goes through each slide, yeah. you can write whatever pertains to you that will make you remember, or that was interest to you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. That's what he's talking about. Okay. So you can print these off. All right. You just want to take one of those. PowerPoint. So. Okay. okay. All right. So, so no questions from last week, other than you want. Uh, Goes a lot of information. Yeah. Right. It is. It actually should be a separate class, not just. You know, Rasmussen's 14th chapter or whatever. But, yeah, that's me. Yeah. I have a question about the syllabus. Mm hmm. Um, for uh, Mike Gray's book, when do we start reading that, or do we just start reading it on Just our start own? reading it. Okay. See, one of, yeah, at Mike Gray's book, or if you get uh, any of the other books that I suggested, see that one of the, the challenges with our field is because mo many people don't just stick with using legal drugs. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other dynamic with the underground economy that you don't necessarily get with Gray's book, but you know, other than reading addict testimonies or getting your information from clients, it was hard to find a book or a series of books that talked about the dynamics of the underground economy. Right? And you can't train street wisdom. Right? I mean, you either live it or you live it vicariously through clients or, you know, any number of things. So one of the things I wanted to, the, the conundrum, it's not so much a conundrum, but uh, more for me like a, um, I told you snow snicker. 
like there was a gang conference at uh well here at Lane the weekend you know last weekend weekend before last right and uh I was representing the gang task force the college of the gang task force in the 90s and that was when uh, according to the police, so you can always trust the police to get, the police are a military organization. Military organizations are very good at threat assessment. That's their thing. They're really good at it. And containing the threat. And suppressing the threat. Okay? But you can't arrest your way out of certain problems. You can't. <laughs> Especially when those problems like let's say, drug-dealing gangs as a phenomenon. Okay? Drug-dealing gangs as a phenomenon have about a 175-year history in the United States. And the first drug-dealing gangs were basically European immigrants. So the people writing about it, so usually what ha happens in academe, so when you have somebody like Rasmussen, writing an academic style book that's a textbook, usually what's going on, what she's describing is like 20 years out of date because that's when academia figured it out to write about it, right? So there are things that change. There are certain things that are timeless, but usually what's happening on the street is happening much faster than you can write about it, right? Hence, yeah, I can give you a book about treatment. Treatment's not going to change that fast, though it should. But telling you about the street without having you live a street life, you know, using Gray's book or other books that relate to what's going on, you know, is, all, is my attempt to try and catch you up. So back to gangs. So drug dealing gangs have about a 175 year history in the United States. The first drug dealing gangs were European immigrants. So this is like during slavery. Okay, so black people. You know, the ones that were enslaved were basically, you know, had universal employment. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? The free blacks basically applied legal trades. The European immigrants, for example, like in New York City, if you were Irish, you could be legally discriminated against. There were actually signs in New York City that said, no Irish need apply for work. Okay, so if you can't get legal work, what do you do? And you still have to feed your family. What do you do? You deal drugs. Now, drugs at the time were basically alcohol. It's before prohibition, so, you know, bathtub, gin, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, whatever legal drug, you know, actually, because of the time we were talking about, heroin was in over the counter cough syrup. It was a legal drug in cough syrup. You could buy it over the counter. Okay? So the illegal drugs are like rum. Whiskey. So you make money doing that, selling to the clientele. And who is that? That's rich white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who don't want to get their hands dirty using the illegal product if they can't have their, you know. So, that's, so when they're writing about who are the gangs, they're talking about Irish, Bohemians, Russians, Swedes, Norwegians, I mean, they're naming all these ethnic groups, and I'm thinking, okay, so those are the criminals? Why are they criminal? Is there anything particularly criminal about the Swedes? I mean, we got stereotypes of Italians, which was also you know, one of the named groups. The Russians? No. Okay? They're immigrants not allowed to join the above-ground economy. So they did the underground economy, and that's where drug-dealing gangs come from. And those were the folks that essentially became, when we talk about organized crime, the mafia in this country, even though it existed in Italy, in this country started out as a street gang and then got bigger. So they got out of drugs and prostitution and gambling, which doesn't mean that they're not into that, but now they can buy insurance companies and record companies. Like Nobody denies that Frank Sinatra might not have been a mafioso, but Warner Brothers certainly was mafia influenced. And that was known. Right? So, when you get things like the Crips and the Bloods, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that means that the only reason that they can get into the business that, that they're in is because the mafia ain't in that business in those towns. Because you know, you don't mess with the boys. 
And they would have no hesitation from wiping you out if you were competition. So if the Crips and Bloods can basically get into the drug dealing business, that's because the mafia ain't in there at that time, in that place, right? So, 1990s, the gangs in 80%, this is from law enforcement sources, 80% of the, what they used to call black style gangs. Crips and Bloods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Quote unquote, black style. 80% of the newer kit crews were white kids. In the 90s. That was their that was the law, that was the cop saying that. Oh, well, wait. 80% are in black, well, you can't call them black style gangs if 80% of the kids are white. <laughs> so they go LA style, like that's different. And they refer to these white kids as wannabes. They're not real gang members, they'll grow out of it. That was the attitude. And basically they did nothing against them. Till now, 20 years later, and I said, uh, back then, uh, I think that's mistaken. These kids are taking this pretty seriously. Maybe you should too. Well, they weren't listening to me. Okay. So 20 years later, this last weekend, they said, oh, it's now 40% white kids. Another 40% are Latino, and then less that, obviously, if you do the math, less than 20% are blacks and other people making up the gangs in Eugene. So how does a largely white police force do gang suppression when they're saying that these white kids that are becoming gang members, some of them are from law enforcement families with 4.0 GPAs? Which is frickin' scary. Uh, yeah. So, if kids from, white kids from law enforcement families with 4.0 GPAs are joining gangs, what does gang suppression look like? Hmm. How do you prevent a kid from theoretically, you know, good supported family from becoming a gang member. Maybe the motivation for becoming a gang member isn't economic. Maybe it's something else. I mean, this goes along with the school shooter question. Which, you know, my, answer, my, my comment on that is, what if these kids aren't actually mentally ill? You can call them crazy, but what if they're not? That's even scarier. I mean, what the DSM doesn't have a classification for? Not just that. The DSM doesn't have a classification for a lot of things. Right. Okay? So as an example, I mean, you, you brought it up. Okay? We just had the King holiday. The people that bombed Martin Luther King's house the people that bombed churches when people were basically doing peaceful protests so they could vote because they had the constitutional right to vote in the South, in the 1950s. Their houses were bombed, people were lynched by what was considered by the DSM, the authorities, as normal people normal American patriotic citizens. They were not crazy. And they, the government, as well as law enforcement, knew who the people were that had committed those crimes and did nothing. They remain unprosecuted until the late 90s and early aughts when you had black district attorneys that said, oh, there's no statute of limitations on murder. You know who it was. We're going after them even if they are 86. Why couldn't you go after them when they were 30 and you knew? Why couldn't you enforce the law? Right? So they're committing those crimes and you're saying that they're normal 
because DSM doesn't say that racism is a mental illness. In fact, even if you are a victim of racism and you have mental health problems as a result of that, you, there is no categorization for that either. Right? So I'm saying, hmm, where does a normal white kid feel that shooting kindergartners is like normal behavior? Well, you can say it's mentally ill, but uh, y'all didn't say nothing in the 40s and 50s and 60s when they were doing that. And those folks were normal. And maybe this is like karma. Oh, that's not in Western psychology, but what if they're socialized to be that violent? as part of normal. Yeah, that's part of normal, okay? Yeah, you're raised to have no empathy for human beings as normal? Huh, well that means you have to, yeah, I mean that was part of the resistance for black psychiatrists saying, look, racism is a mental illness. So whether you decide you crazy or not, we have to design our own healing <laughs> for this. Your question first. Go ahead. Well, empathy is a biological thing. If there's a part of your brain that creates empathy, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think if you're given feedback as a child, even if it's negative towards a race or a sex or something like that, you're going to have empathy, maybe just not towards a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. I think it's different than just straight up empathy. Yes. I was just using one thing that we could track. Okay, so we don't know what the genes are for empathy yet. We haven't worked that out. We can just say that emotions, you know, I have to be able to identify with you some, some way as familiar. And I also think that just because a kid is raised in a middle class family doesn't mean they have access to money. I know a lot of kids raised in a middle class family that have no access right. to money. And right now, without being able to get a job because of the economy, people right. are not hiring kids. Right, people right. They hire. Right. So and I think it still could have an impact. Yeah. And in fact, you, well, what I'm saying is that the literature hasn't caught up to this, right? It has said, you know, just like a, one of the, the gang experts from Portland, you know, this you know, white sociologist said, you know, kid told him, look, Hewlett Packard isn't hiring and the bloods are. <laughs> so, yeah, we may be selling to rich guys from Beaverton, but the Bloods are hiring and Hewlett Packard is not. So yeah, it could be partially economic. But again, this is scary for those folks. Well, all of us, but this is scary, right? So part of the piece is the academia lags behind category, having an answer for many social trends, including gangs, including you know, why do people have certain motivations to do like, you know, uh, what is that stuff called? Spice, bath salts. Well, I mean, you are taking your life into your hands anytime you do a street drug that you don't have an analysis on, right? So why would you smoke something or shoot, shoot something that has a bunch of chemical names on it, maybe? But you don't know what the effect is going to be. Curiosity. Well, family with a bunch of people now that are coming in. In the last three months, we've seen uh, people coming in the waves. Yeah. Uh, the bath salts. Right. And people say, oh, they're eating the face, they're eating, they're doing this, doing that. But if you look at the result, if you look at the effects of methamphetamine on anybody, yeah. bath salts is not that much different. It's yeah. just something you can buy on the counter. Right. So it seems now they're publicizing, oh, we got to ban this. Well, we ain't banned it. And right. The meth trade is still pouring in from different right. countries. So right. it's not like it's, but it's, it's definitely a different dynamic. You yeah. can go down and, you know, instead of going over your dope man's house with a stolen DVD player, you gotta get 40 bucks up for this gram of bath salts that they market that way, and as soon as they get hit to it, they change the, mold, the name of it and they remarket it. Right. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, it has, and that's been part of it. So stuff like gray does cover that a little bit, but you usually have to, you know, get that kind of information from multiple sources. Your question. Oh, I just had a comment. Okay. Right. I'll allow it. Oh, it was just about when you said when a person has no empathy, that's not really classified. I was just thinking about when they classify sociopaths. Right. They don't have empathy. And they're very charming and personable and stuff like that, but they don't really care about you. They're simulating empathy, they but... That yeah. could be part of that for a person. Could be. 
Could be. So um, just to get into it, so I focused on culture because that's often one of the major uh, barriers to access to treatment for large numbers of people. And because it's higher ed, so you know, in higher ed, culture was a code word for race and ethnicity. But in dope, that is addiction treatment, we understand that potheads are different from meth addicts, are different from heroin addicts, are different from lots of different folks, and your socioeconomic status will produce even more differences. So we had to look at this dimension of culture from beyond just race and ethnicity. So culture is inclusive of any difference that you can perceive and catalog. And so that's generally what I'm talking about and the literature is slow to catch up to that. Not in the substance abuse fee prevention field, where basically we looked at, and I've kind of tried to reflect it in the biopsychosocials. Okay? We're not just looking at race and ethnicity or gender, but also gender expression, drug of choice, routes of administration, socioeconomic status, economic background, family of origin, it, all those are a culture, all of them. And they all have an influence on people's use and you can use those as a way in to get somebody clean and sober long term, if you know what to do. And so usually one of the reasons that I focus, for example, on race and ethnicity, they're just one of the more obvious major barriers. I don't know if any of you, uh, go to, um, I, I was at um, the Bill W. movie at the Bijou yesterday. You heard about it? Okay, there's a movie about Bill W. at the Bijou playing this week. Huh? A -A -A yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's basically, it's like a documentary, but they've also, so they've got like home movies from when he was alive. Plus, uh, they've got actors playing various people. So if uh, you're a person in recovery, they basically, the camera angle has you, your face in shadow, maintaining your anonymity. Uh, and or if they've got a group shot with he's in, they've basically uh, fuzzed out the, the picture, the, the faces. But otherwise, if it's actors, you know, and they're doing a reenactment, they do that. And so... One of the things that happened that, uh, that Bill talked about is, so they're starting AA and they're trying to have this fledgling movement uh, because treatment at the time was like crazy. They do electroshock therapy, they do lobotomies, they do all these different things to try and treat alcoholics. And so they're just trying to have this social movement. So uh, he once brought these two black guys who were in AA, who had their own little AA group, were trying to get, they just had them, them too. So it was just like Dr. Bob and Bill W. And they were trying to start an AA group in Harlem because alcoholics are everywhere, right? That's why it's so easy to you know, do an AA thing. So Bill brings them to a standing AA meeting, and, which is all white. And he apparently didn't think about this, but it is 1930s, so okay. So he brings them in, and they immediately object and don't want these black people in with them. So let's put it to a vote. No, we don't want the black people in here. Out. Well, okay, do you agree that black people need AA? Yes. <laughs> but not in our group. Okay. Well, then the third vote was taken can they observe so they can learn how to do an AA meeting in their community? Yes, they allowed that. So there's a piece where, hmm, there's always been this racial tension. Even though we're supposed to be united with all, you know, we're all addicts and alcoholics, but race is a divide. Race is a barrier. It's there. And I'm glad that they talked about that in the film because I'm saying, all right, that should be kind of our standard of reference. We're deal we should deal from the medical point of view, not the, you know, if there are racial or other barriers, we should eliminate them wherever they exist. All right. So we come to, for example, the Oregon administrative rules. Now, 
I told you last week or the last couple of weeks that part of our job has evolved. Part of the ethical code, if you get certified, is not just getting people clean and sober in individuals and groups. It might be some activism, too. Changing the laws, changing the policies. Might be. So just because I'm not going to tell you to do something that I haven't done, got these OARs that are the current ones. So what I've done is I underline specific, italics underline refer to specific language that I wrote and injected when we were doing this in the 1990s around barriers to treatment. So it's under client rights, among other places. Barriers to treatment. Where there is a barrier to service due to culture, gender, language, illiteracy, or disability, the program shall develop a holistic treatment approach, including support services available to address or overcome those barriers, including, okay, so notice what we're talking about. There's a culture based on language, culture, we didn't define that to race and, or confine it to race and ethnicity. That was intentional. Language, okay, because sometimes our clinical language is above clients' heads. And their language and their literacy. We can have people that are illiterate in English. Speak English. Yeah, I am. Medical English, okay? Because uh, that's neurotransmitter. That's the shortest word you can use to explain that concept. Making reasonable modifications in policies, practices, and procedures to avoid discrimination unless the program can demonstrate that doing so would fundamentally alter the nature of the service, program, or activity, such as providing individuals capable of assisting the program in minimizing barriers, such as interpreters. This could be cultural interpreters, not just language. Translation of written materials to appropriate language or method of communication. So this is ASL as well as Braille or whatever or just making it user-friendly. To the degree possible, providing assistive devices which minimize the impact of the barrier, and to the degree possible, acknowledging cultural and other values which are important to the client. Right. And so also they do, uh, they do their journaling on, uh, on the quarter. Yes. And when we bring you this bag. Yeah. Or we don't bring, we won't bring you one at a time. It's non-bilingual. We'll bring in two at a time to make sure that one of them is bilingual so he can be given the full, the trying. Right. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more we can do, but I, I know there is, I see that. Yeah. not charging clients for the cost, whatever the cost, I mean, because, yeah, that should be in there. Referring to them an to another provider if the client or try requires treatment outside of the referring program's area of specialization, the program would make for a similar referral for an individual without disability. Now, where we place this was that there are, my, if for in terms of race, race and ethnicity, there are minority-specific programs. But we placed it here because we said, well, why shouldn't everybody be held to the standard? Why should just minority programs be held to a level of cultural competency? Because guess what? I have to be culturally competent with white clients. That's who I see, mostly. Heaven help them, they get me. But there it is, even the skinheads have to deal with me and I have to be culturally competent with them at whatever le level they are. So if I can do that with a skinhead, I think a generic program can work with a middle class black person who's an alcoholic. Just saying. With basic stuff. Yeah. Do you guys, I don't know, in all the different treatment firms, I support a lot of people with developmental disabilities mm -hmm. that live in 24 hour group homes mm -hmm. and they need a lot of well, not all of them, but... Well, a lot of intensive work. Uh, and a lot, yeah, and a lot of interpretation. And it's usually their staff that have known them for years that are the only interpreters. And right. We've come up 
across problems like, oh, well, the staff can't come because of confidentiality, but they're not certified interpreters. Right. You know, it's, and then this person can't get services. And people say, well, they're in a group home. You guys should be able to do that. But group uh, home services are much different right. than addiction services. Right, right. That's right. Yes, it's one of those things where it, they kind of fall through the cracks yeah. because of a definition of in the law, and it's you know they used to be a comfortable minority, right. Right, which you could basically warehouse out of sight. Right. But as the population grows, will the industry grow with it? Right, and that's not part of the standard training set, either. Right. So that's why I also started having the class, because people started taking the class who were outside of A&D, who were becoming cops or group home workers or whatever that needed this information. And the state was doing cross-training of, you know, DHS, child protective workers, medical foster care folks, et cetera, et cetera, until the money ran out, right? Oh yeah, I'm a mandatory reporter, but you know, we're actually not going to take kids out of the home if they're between, tw between 12 and 17. But you still have to report. But we ain't got no money to do nothing. Uh, okay. So it's a similar situation, right? All right, so the language assumes the barriers in the program, not in the client. And it, as it often is. So, and it's not that the client is non-compliant by raising race or gender or sexual orientation or whatever it is, or an emotional issue in treatment. They're just being themselves, representing their real needs. So, sorry if it doesn't fit your framework, or Bill W's or Dr. Bob's orientation from the 1930s. But Bill, Doc, Bill did try to bring in some equity into AA early on, but he got resistance. And there was an interesting thing when he basically talked about his LSD use when LSD was a legal prescription drug. Because he, he basically fought all his life with depression. And when he had, spirit had spiritual experiences on LSD, yeah, well, I, he's being upfront about that. But, and then he stopped doing it when it became illegal. But he's saying, look, uh, you know, I, he was always upfront about his depression and all the other things that he was in. He was involved, engaged with. So the best way often to address this is to change the workforce to become more conscious and competent, not necessarily the program itself. So that's part of the justification for doing this class, really. So unless you design a program for it. So four years ago, five years ago now, we had the first African American Treatment Summit in Miracles. The last one was in September of uh, 2012. Uh, and this is a workshop by a couple of people that I know that used to do Project Network. And Project Network was basically uh, Olivia's uh, black woman, CADC2 director um, at the time. And Project Network was basically dealing with, it was basically Portland's answer to Willamette family in the sense that it's women's treatment with kids trying to engage, so inpatient and outpatient, trying to engage families and mostly African American. And so one of the things that often happened that was kind of alluded to in the Bill W. movie is that you would have, you know, it's not that the groups are racially exclusive, but in certain areas of town or in certain cities, you'd, have, you'd be able to go to a gay and lesbian friendly group, or you'd go to an all black group. And there were white people in it, but they weren't being exclusive, right? And so what happens when black 12-steppers get together and say, okay, there's enough for us. We're not finding success in treatment, though we did get clean and sober. What if we created our own treatment program using 12 steps as a model. How would we do that? So here's how they did that. So if it's not culturally specific, it's dominant culture. So dominant culture means we don't talk about race. We don't talk about anything that would not be appropriate on a, in an Aussie and Harriet world. Am I using, how many of you know about Aussie and Harriet? 
Okay, let's see. I guess I have to use the appropriate. <laughs> yeah, leave it to Beaver, right? Yeah, what they used to call, uh, you know, the what was used to refer to as the stereotypical television white family of the '50s, where mom's in the home, dad works a corporate job, and they have 2.3 kids and a dog and cat and goldfish. Wasn't so much all in the family. Yeah. Not, yeah, it wasn't so much all in the family, you know. So, culturally specific. So, recognizing de the, de the definition of culture, uh, not just race and ethnicity, but in this case, they were talking about it. So, when they're talking about staffing issues, remember, so they're presenting to a group of not just black practitioners, but everybody in the field, because, you know, this is a small state. Sooner or later, everybody knows everybody else, <laughs> one way or the other. So, Non-African American staff must acknowledge racism and create an atmosphere conducive to discussing social injustice and oppression. African American staff must recognize the effects racism has had on their lives to avoid impeding in clients' progress. So one of the things they're saying here is if you're not black, you need to acknowledge that racism exists and be able to talk about it with anybody. And if you are black, you need to look at your own stuff before you engage people because you're going to be triggered and addicts are going to be tricky. People might raise racism as an issue when it's not the issue. They're just trying to freak you out. Just like a gay person might shock you with talking about their sexuality just to check you out. Or... A heterosexual woman, you know, might hit on you, or any number of things. People will do lots of stuff to freak you out from dealing with their stuff. They will. They'll use any trick in the book. Duh. Get ready for it. That's all. So all staff must recognize the power differential in a clinical relationship. There is a power relationship going on. You don't just have the power to, not fl to flunk them in treatment so they don't get their kids back. That's a very basic one. But there is a power differential. You got more, they got less of certain types of power. They cannot buy into power struggles with clients and they cannot take things personally. Oh, you're racist. Uh, what kind of racist am I exactly? Describe the power dynamic. So, issues our women walk in the door with. So, alienation, internal and external oppression, and hate that's been internalized. If you've been an object of hate, you internalize that, you take that hate on, just like an abused person takes on the guilt and shame of the abuser, identifies with the abuser, and they will do what they need to do to survive. Especially if they detect a power relationship. They will do what, they, what worked for them to survive and a power inequity. All right? So, social disenfranchisement, anger, separation from family and kids, trauma affecting the parent child relationship.